We're going to be thinking about souls and bodies. So, so let's see if I can remember what I talked about yesterday, because if I can't, that's bad news, isn't it? Uh, we talked about the goodness of creation. That creation is good precisely because God is so good. God is such a good God that all that he does is good, and therefore his creatures are good. And as we see in Genesis 1, the pinnacle of God's creative activity is the creation of uh, men and women in his image as very good. We're going to spend uh, time today thinking um, about human constitution, that is to say how we are sort of made up by God, and we're going to think particularly about souls and bodies. Um, and what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to have, so yet yesterday, what was the word yesterday? This is sort of turning into big word seminar. Yesterday was metaphysics. I'm going to prime you in advance that today's big word to wow your friends with is hylomorphism. Um, and also, a little bit later, I am going to get you all uh, to learn and say out loud a couple of Hebrew words. So J James Robson asked if I was going to be selling tickets when I told him that. James gets very excited by anything Hebrew. So that's where we're going. Um, we're going to think about a little bit of philosophy about how the soul and the body are imagined to relate together in various ways. Then we're going to think about what the Bible says. That's a fairly solid ground for us to land on, isn't it? But we're going to start by thinking about bodies. Um, and what I'm not going to do today <laughs> uh, is get into questions about gender and transgender and gender dysphoria um, and sexuality, but although we're not actually going to go there, I'm not going there because in one of the later weeks we're going to have seminars on those kinds of questions. Uh, what I'm doing today is laying the kinds of foundations that will enable us to address those questions wisely and biblically. Um, who is the real me? How does the real me relate to my body? How does the real me relate to my body as male or female? Those kinds of things. So although I'm not going to make the applications, what I'm hoping is we could come out of this seminar, hear someone make the applications and go, oh yeah, that's fairly obvious from what the Bible teaches about souls and bodies. So we're going to start with bodies. Uh, heading number one, human creatures are bodies. And a little health warning as we begin. Uh, my argument is going to unfold stage by stage, and I'm going to say a few things that if you just latch on to this thing, you, are, you may be misled as to what I really believe, and, uh, or you may freak out and think, what is he denying here? So bear with me as I start with human creatures are bodies. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, and I'll read from verse 5. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And I just want to draw attention to the word formed there. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. Uh, you'll see on the screen, the, the Hebrew word for formed, uh, translated formed, is yatsar, uh, and it's the word that is used of a potter uh, molding clay. Um, so here, here God, as it were, scoops up a handful of dirt and as a highly skilled potter, moulds a body. Think about the language of Psalm 139. You have woven me together in my mother's womb. John Goldingay, in his commentary on the Psalms, translates it as you've embroidered my, me. So we're to think of God here as a master craftsman. This is not your kind of cheap, baseline, um, mass-marketed pottery from Sainsbury's or Ikea, where, where it's just a production line, probably somewhere in China, just knocking out plates that are going to scratch within the first time you put a knife on them. This is a, a master craftsman 
creating artisan pottery where each piece of pottery is formed by hand and is distinctive and different and beautiful. So that every cup is recognizably a cup, but you haven't got a set that are just identical and bland. So formed, carefully formed bodies. That's the man that God forms. And then if we look at Genesis 2 and verse 22. God has brought all the animals to Adam. We'll look at the second, second half of verse 20. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Verse 22. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And I just want to draw attention there to the word made. In Genesis 1, there are a couple of different words used for creating or making. This is a different word again. And it is the, word, the Hebrew word bana, which really means to build. It's an architectural image. Um, one of the places where you see um, the word bana used repeatedly in the Old Testament is in 1 Kings 6 to 8, which is where T Solomon builds the temple. And it turns out that when Solomon builds the temple, the temple in some ways looks rather a lot like a woman. Um, there's an elegance and a proportion. In the Hebrew, the temple has ribs, it has a face, it has shoulders. And so here in Genesis 2, as the woman is built as a bride for the man, She is built as a bride who kind of foreshadows a temple. She's built as a bride who kind of foreshadows a city full of buildings. She's built as a bride that foreshadows a bride who will be a temple and a city and a people for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the point is the architectural metaphor. And, and, and two points, actually. One is, in both cases, in the creation of the man and the creation of the woman, there is incredible skill and beauty involved, attention to detail, and also they're described differently. The man is yatsard. He's, he's formed like by a potter. The woman is barnard. She's built by an architect. But here's the thing, the first thing we learn actually is profoundly related to our bodies. Um, God forms bodies with care and attention. And one of the things I'm going to push throughout the rest of this seminar is that I don't have a body, I am a body. Think about it like this. Um, imagine I sort of drive onto the site in my car. Um, and you also have, you've parked in one of the car parks, and I sort of, I'm thinking about the seminar I'm giving in a couple of days' time, and sort of writing it in my mind as I go, I've already written them, but I'm sort of mulling it over in my mind as I go, and I scrape down the side of your car as I park my car. I imagine you'd be pretty upset with me for my carelessness, but I've damaged something that belongs to you. Now imagine I drive onto site and I run over your foot. And I get out of the car and I say, don't worry, I haven't harmed you, I've only run over your foot. Your body is you. If I harm your body, I harm you. I don't want to go into questions of, of abuse and things like that, but immediately this raises these issues, doesn't it? The profound damage it does to us, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, in our conception of ourselves and our understanding of how we relate to the rest of the world, when our bodies are harmed by other people. And this is a truth that is established in creation, in those verses I've just read, that we are bodies, and that is eternally confirmed in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 
It is these mortal bodies that will be raised and transformed and glorious forever, purged of the kind of dilapidated weakness and raised in glory. But it's this body that will be raised, your body now that will be raised. We will recognize each other. We will finally be our true selves, not in the absence of these bodies, but as these bodies. And there's a middle term in there, isn't it? Establishing creation, and of course, absolutely reaffirmed in the incarnation, because the Lord Jesus Christ himself is able to pray in the words of Psalm 139, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God loves human bodies so much that his son took one for his very own. How great and beautiful and dignified human bodies are. That God created us as bodies precisely so that his son could get one for our salvation. Okay, so we're bodies built with great care. Um, how does Adam know he's different from the animals? In other words, what I'm going to try and establish now is not just we are bodies, but our bodies are deeply meaningful and significant and tell us an awful lot about us. How does Adam know that he's different from the animals? So verse 18 of, of Genesis 2, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. Uh, oh no, that's verse 15. I'm very short-sighted. Um, verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, the Lord God had formed, oh, there's that word again, out of the ground, all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. And we're going to see it a bit later, the way Genesis does two things. It sort of closes the gap between us and animals and then makes that gap really big again in different ways. But one of the ways, they're formed out of the, just as Adam has been formed out of the ground, the animals have been formed out of the ground. And so you're thinking, huh, here are, here are going to be some pretty suitable helpers for Adam. Because they're going to be quite like him, aren't they? They're formed out of the ground too. He formed, God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, how is Adam able to give names to the animals? How is he able to look at this array of animals marching before him and go, oh, that's a cheetah, uh, that's a parrot, uh, there's a ca kangaroo, um, how can he tell the difference? How can he go, that's a cheetah and that's a kangaroo, and there's no confusing them? Because of their bodily form, right? How can he look and go, oh, look, there's a male cheetah and there's a female cheetah, and there's a male chimpanzee and there's a female chimpanzee. And there are ways in which we can kind of go, well, the males are quite similar to each other in certain respects, and the females are quite similar to each other in certain respects. But really, there's no doubt that cheetahs and chimpanzees are very different because of their bodily form, and, and as well because of the sexual form of their bodies. So, so he's discovering, because of these bodies, I can know what these animals are. And I can also know that there are males and females of these different animals. And then he goes, hang on a minute. Two cheetahs, two parrots, two leopards, two kangaroos, and me. How does Adam know that he's different from the animals? Well, in part, it's because he's been given the job of naming them. But actually, a lot of it is just to do with, well, I don't really look like them, do I? And here I am, all alone, surrounded by these pairs of creatures. How does Adam know that he is similar to and different from the woman? The Lord God formed, or built rather, a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, verse 22, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now, or perhaps better, now at last, 
This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. If you, we're not going to look at the references, um, which aren't actually on there, but there are, there, there are handouts that have been uploaded to the website, uh, and they've got references to other Old Testament texts. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh is family language. You know, we might say, oh, he's my flesh and blood. Um, the Hebrew idiom is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. We're family. At last, I found an animal who's like me. Don't get thrown by that word animal. We'll come back to it. Um, she's like me, and she's different from me. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. How does he know that she's different from him? I mean, we know they're both naked, right? It's a fairly simple equation. I remember when our first child was born, she was born by cesarean section, uh, and the surgeon pulled this baby up and went, Dad, what is it? And I panicked. And I was like, if I get this wrong, I will never hear the end of it. <laughs> and then I looked, and I went, oh, that's easy, it's a girl. We know because of the form of our body. And the way they are named tells us something about them as well, tells us, uh, tells us about their differences. So the man is called Adam, Adam, um, because he's taken from the ground, which in Hebrew is the Adamah. There's a, there's a play on words. He is Adam from the Adamah. We might call him earthling from the earth. Or this is, I mean, I'm afraid I live in a world of bad puns. The Latin for uh, earth is terra. So let's call him Terry. Uh, or, or if you think about, you know, you're recovering your sea legs and you're like, finally, I'm back on solid ground again. You say, oh, I'm back on terra firma. So we'll call him Terry Firm from now on. This is Terry Firm from the terra firma. And then the woman is Isha from the man, Ish. So in, in English, it works quite well, actually. In, it does it. I remember talking to an Italian who was very confused about all this because... Um, it, it doesn't work in the same way. Womo and donna, they just don't sound the same. But isha from the ish, woman from the man. Or, again, stupid play on words that I heard someone else do and I'm just repeating for you. Ish sounds a lot like the word for aish, which is fire. There's something about that, that fire is glorious. And actually, a, a, the man is glorified and more glorious now that he has a bride. He's no longer a bag of dirt. He becomes fire boy because he now has his flame girl. It's not mine, don't blame me. Here are the implications. So you see, this is profoundly bodily, and our bodies carry meaning about who we are in relation to the rest of creation, and who we are in relation to one another as male and female, and who we are in relation to ourselves as male or female. So implications, as a species, we are male, and female. And the Lord Jesus in uh, uh, Matthew 19, verse, verses 3 and following, uh, reaffirms that. When the Pharisees come and ask him about divorce, Jesus says, no, no, stop talking about the law of Moses. We need to go further back than that. We need to go back to the beginning. Have you not heard that from the beginning, God created the male and female? As a species, we are male and female from the beginning right down until the present day. And each one of us is either uh, male or female. How do we know? We know because of our bodies. Which means that my body is basic to understanding who I am. And that may please you, or it may fill you with a kind of nameless dread. And I'm in middle age, so it fills me with a nameless dread. Um, I like mornings when I look in the mirror because I'm not wearing my glasses. I, and I like mornings after the shower when I'm looking in the mirror because it's all steamed up. My body is basic to understanding who I am. I, I am either male or female defined by my body. Human creatures are bodies. And I think we get off on the wrong foot, no pun intended, if we start by talking about souls. But we are not just bodies, so let's move on. 
Uh, we'll, we'll, there'll be time for questions in a few minutes, but I just want to do this next little bit. Point two, human creatures. What kind of bodies are we? Human creatures are ensouled bodies. Another way of saying that is human creatures are animated bodies. Another way of saying that is human creatures are living bodies. And we're going to think just for a minute about basic views on the relationship of souls and bodies. And I'm going to suggest there are three basic views. There are probably four, actually, but I'm going to suggest three because one of them just isn't terribly important for what I want to do. Materialism. This is kind of the view of um, Richard Dawkins uh, as one example, which is we are just bodies. Um, in the words of Mary Harrington, uh, describing some of these views, we're flesh computers. Uh, we're, we're kind of um, biological machines. Roger Scruton, the, 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 the great late philosopher, describes this view as thinking that we are complicated byproducts of our DNA. Richard Dawkins says the human organism is a survival machine for our DNA. That's what we are, a survival machine for our DNA. It's the idea that all we are is a, 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 a biological mechanism, and we can go down the various layers and we can think about how our organs relate to one another in our bodies. And we can think about the function of particular organs. And then we can go down to the cellular level and we can think about how the cells work in our bodies. And then we can go down to the sort of uh, atomic level and the subatomic level. And what we are in the end is a bunch of sort of electrical and chemical processes. And my wife is a science teacher. I don't think she'll listen to this, but in case she does, I'm going to stop there so that I don't expose my ignorance. But the point being, all we are in the end is we can go down and down and down the levels and say we are, we are highly sophisticated machines for replicating DNA. But even lower than that, we're just a bunch of subatomic particles that have been arranged in certain patterns. What that does to free human freedom is an interesting question. Are we just determined, but am I just determined by the sort of chemical processes that go on in my mind. And so you can do all kinds of interesting scans of people's brains. I go, what happens when someone's praying? Which part of the brain is at work there? What happens when someone is experiencing excitement or sorrow? And we can be reduced to just a sort of graph of our chemical processes. That's materialism. You see how diminishing it is. Then there's dualism. And this would have been historically the much more common thing, which was we are composed of two substances, a soul and a body, so that soul plus body brought together to make it some kind of, into some kind of relationship to make a human. Uh, we're going to think very quickly about Plato, uh, who thought the soul and the body are two separate substances. So Plato was a Greek philosopher, about 400 and something BC. Um, and Plato thought the real identity of a person, he wouldn't have used the word person, a real identity of a human um, lies within the soul. Uh, and so what is a human for Plato? We are a rational and immortal soul created to contemplate the true, the good, and the beautiful in a disembodied way and we are imprisoned in a body. So we are souls imprisoned in bodies, trapped in the world of the senses, waiting to be freed so that um, we can go and contemplate the good, the true, and the beautiful without bodies. So salvation is released from the body. In the modern world, uh, the sort of fountainhead of this is a Frenchman, of course, called Rene Descartes. Uh, 1596 to 1650, and he didn't talk about souls and bodies, he talked about minds and bodies, but he said something very similar. He, he said, what, what you really are is a mind, you are a thinking thing um, that just happens to have some kind of undefined relationship to a body. And so Descartes thought the world was divided into mind, which are non-extended, they don't have a sort of 
um, extension. They don't have like a place really in the physical world, a non-extended thinking thing. Is that how you would like to think about yourself? I think for some of us it probably is, isn't it? Uh, my body is useful for carrying my brain to my book and holding the book before my eyes. A non-extended thinking thing, that's the real me. And this is a world of pure interiority so that I can never know the real you. I have no access to it. And then you have the material world of extended, as in occupying a place in space, extended thinking things. And for Descartes, that is purely mechanical. It's a very mechanistic, machine-like understanding about how our bodies work and how causation works. And this is a world of pure exteriority. And there is actually, for Descartes, no obvious connection between the mind and the body. So, for Plato, what is a human being? An immortal soul imprisoned in a body. For Descartes, what is a human being? In the words of the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, you are a ghost in a machine. Now, I want to say, track through the contemporary shift from thinking to feeling and desiring and wanting, and how many of our contemporaries actually think of themselves fundamentally as a bundle of desires that should not be limited by the limitations of my body in all kinds of ways. Now, I'm going to suggest an alternative, which is hylomorphism. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, hylomorphism, which comes from two Greek words, because the idea originates with a philosopher called Aristotle, who was Plato's pupil. The word, well, hyli, or hule, depending on how you learn to pronounce Greek, because, of course, you all did. Um, the word hule means matter. The word morphe means form. So it's, it's a matter-formism view of the body. The soul is the form of the body. Don't get distracted by Peter Martyr Vermigli for a moment. We'll get to him. So for, for Aristotle, things are made up of matter and form. So this music stand here is made up of matter. I take it it's probably made of steel um, with bits of rubber by the look of it. What is it, though, that, that, that distinguishes this music stand from that speaker stand and from those um, pillars and the girders that are holding up this room? They're all made of the same material. What makes them different? Well, it is their form. Okay, those pillars have the form of pillar. This music stand has the form of music stand because it's been created by a creator and has had that form kind of, I don't know what, I don't know how you make a music stand, um, with, a, with, a, with a mold and a machine and a whatever it is, to have that form pressed into it so that now this matter has the form music stand and it's been made for a reason so that musicians or conference speakers have something to hold their music or their notes. Now, when it comes to living things, Aristotle has the same kind of thing. You are made of form and matter, and the form is what we are going to call soul. Um, okay? Now, we're going to think about what this means. Now, this is Aristotle's view. It's picked up by a medieval theologian called Thomas Aquinas. And then it's taken from Aquinas right into the mainstream of Reformation theology. So I think the Plato view you find in Calvin, um, but the, the, this, this view, the hylomorphism view, you find in most of the other reformers, Lutheran and Reformed, in England, in Switzerland, in Germany, Denmark, Poland, or Italy, all over the place. So this is actually a very common view in Protestant theology until René Descartes shows up on the scene in the 17th century. All right, history lesson over. What is hylomorphism, apart from a long word? Here's Peter Marta Vermigli. So Peter Marta Vermigli was an Italian reformer who was very influential in the English Reformation. Um, he taught at, um, at, um, during the reign of uh, King Edward VI. He taught at Cambridge University. 
Uh, he was an Old Testament lecturer by trade, but also a very gifted theologian and philosopher. And this is from his commentary on the verses we've been looking at, Genesis 2, 5 to 7. Peter Martyr says this, the soul is the drive and form of the body. It is the mover, the motor of the body. Okay, what does that mean? Well, the form is what makes this set of atoms and molecules a body, rather than you know, the air you're breathing or the, the water in the lake. It makes it a body. Not just a body, though, a human body. A, a living body, a human body, and then your body. So what, why, why have the atoms in the world arranged themselves in such a way that we don't just see amorphous blobs in this room, but we see distinct individual people? Because each of you has a form that makes you, you, human, male or female, and you, and that form is called your soul. And the soul is the drive or the motor. Or, as I put it earlier, is the animate, or as I put it there, the animating principle of the body. Now, I think it's helpful to me, at least, I hope it's helpful to you, to learn that the Latin word for soul is anima. So let's pause for a moment. And the, oh, and the basic meaning of anima, the Latin word, is wind or breath. Hold that thought, because we're going to come to the Greek and the Hebrew and see something very similar. Anima, wind, breath. Now, just call out. Latin is the root, one of the roots for English. English words that sound like anima. A animal. Animated. So, what is an animal? It's something that has a soul. something that is animated, it's living. What is a rock? Description of a rock that sounds a bit like anima. Inanimate, because it doesn't have a soul. It's not living and moving. And so actually, in this understanding of souls and bodies, there are three types, three basic types of soul. There's a vegetative soul, which is what things like grass and fruit trees and things like that have. Because plants are living, aren't they? They grow, they move, they respire, they take in nutrients, they respond to stimuli, they reproduce. They are animate, not inanimate. Rocks don't have souls. Plants have vegetative souls. Animals have animal souls. Um, or sensitive souls, because they live in a world of sense experience. They respond in a more vigorous way to stimuli. They, they experience some kind of emotions of fear or aggression uh, or pain. Uh, they move around more um, in response to those stimuli, and they respond. They're able to respond more to their environments. And then you have a third kind of soul, which for Aristotle and those who come after him is a rational soul. That's what marks humans out as different from animals, the ability to reason, the ability to use language, the ability to think in, in more abstract and conceptual and creative ways. The ability to develop language that follows patterns of grammar rather than just instinctive kind of growls and shrieks and cries. Okay? We'll come back to that thought as well. Um, Last question, what happens when your soul and body are separated? You die. And what happens to your body? Yeah. And so I think immediately you have a sort of, like, this is not a stupid view, is it? The, the soul is the animating principle of the body. It's the life force, the driver. And it's what makes your body, make, what makes these atoms your body, and once the soul and the body are separated, there is no life, and the body is going to disintegrate. And those, those atoms and molecules are going to turn into something else. There'll be another form pressed on them. All right. Let's keep going. Because now we're going to get to the Bible, and this is where it gets fun.
I think that's all been fun, but this is where it gets fun. Because I'm going to get you to stand up, please. Um, and just two quick things to say. Uh, I, I shouldn't have got you to stand up now, but I'm not going to get you to sit down now. You can stand for a moment. If you need to sit down, please feel free to do so. Um, the Greek word for soul is psuche. And the basic meaning, like the Latin, is breath or life. The Hebrew word that tends to get translated soul is nefesh. Okay, that P is a soft sound. It's pfft. It's an F sound, nefesh. It comes 740 times in the Old Testament. The basic meaning of the word nefesh is probably breath. And I'm on thin ice here because I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Um, and James isn't in the room. So actually, I can speak confidently. Um, some people would say the basic meaning is throat or gullet. I'm not persuaded. I think throat or gullet comes from breath because where does your breath go? Yeah. Um, throat or gullet, soul... Self or myself, life, living creature, person. It only rarely means soul. I think in Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, you get, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Okay, so soul seems to mean what we would think of as soul there. But the basic meaning is breath. And so for a moment, I want you to, I'll show you what to do. Breathe in and breathe out as loud as you can. So, <laughs> breathe out through your mouth and feel it coming from here. As you push your breath out, you shouldn't be breathing from your chest. Breathe from your gut. Okay. That is the life force flowing through you. Right? Why do you have life? Because you're able to do that. Because you breathe in and you breathe out the toxins. You breathe in the life. You breathe out the toxins. And so breath is absolutely basic to life. And did you notice how physical that sensation was? How physical your soul is, or your experience of your soul, your breath, your life is. You can feel your nose, you, you, your nostrils squeezing together, and it's cold, isn't it? And then you can feel the air rushing over your teeth and your tongue, and you can feel your stomach muscles contracting. You can sit down now. Let's put this together back in Genesis 2, verse 7. What is going on in Genesis 2? The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Two words, nefesh chaya. Okay, I said I was going to teach you how to pronounce Hebrew. We're going to say nefesh and we're going to say, and, and, and I want you to say it sort of, really exaggerating the, the consonants, nefesh. And then the second word, uh, let me explain how to pronounce it, chaya. So that, the dot under it, it's a very guttural sound. You, you, you're wanting to spit on the back of the head of the person in front of you. So I want you to really project and to say this as dramatically as you possibly can. Chaya. <laughs> nefesh chaya. Okay, if we're not all a lot wetter than we were, we weren't doing that right. Now, I want you to say the Greek word psuche, slowly, exaggerate, psuche. You hear, these are onomatopoeic words. You know, an onomatopoeic word, it sounds like what it's representing. Psuche is breath. Nefesh, chaya. Okay, that was for you, James. Um, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a, all together now, nefesh chaya, a living creature. So there are two stages to the creation of Adam. I think, can we have the next slide up? I think we might, that might be helpful. Yeah. Two stages. You've got forming a body, and then breathing life into the body. So the Lord forms like a potter, and you have this inanimate body. And then he brings the body to life. How does he do it? By, by breathing into the man's nostrils the breath of life. And so, Adam becomes a nefesh chaya, a living creature, 
in contrast to a dead one. And so one writer on the, on the word nephesh, the word soul, says, according to Genesis 2, a person does not have a vital self, a, a, an animating principle. A person is a vital self. That's what you are. You are a living creature. You are a nephesh chayah. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, implications. I am not a soul that has a body. I think Plato and Descartes and others are wrong on that. The basic you is not your soul. The basic you is an ensouled body, an animated, living body, because you are a body into which the Lord God has breathed the breath of life. And one day, the Lord will remove the breath of life from you. And your body will cease to be you. It will be your body. It will be your earthly remains. But it will no longer be you in a way that we can relate to you in a meaningful way. There will be no life force there. And your earthly life will be over. And then one day, the Lord Jesus Christ will stand before your grave and say, come out. And will once again breathe life into your body. He will reassemble. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't know how the physics of it will work but he will reassemble this body, formed, crafted, built, perfected, and you will step forth and live. So what are you? You are an ensouled, animated, living body because you are a body into which God has breathed the breath of life. Let's skip over. Uh, no, your body is you. Your body is you. So not, I am not merely a soul or an I temporarily linked to a prison or a machine. Okay, the real you. When I meet your body, I'm not just meeting your body. You know, you could show me your car and go, that's my car that you just scraped. I promise I haven't scraped anyone's car this morning. This is not my guilty conscience talking. But when I meet you... When I meet your body, I meet you. Nor, um, yes, I'm not arbitrarily trapped in a body either. It's really important to emphasize. Because I'm the body that God has carefully crafted or built and into which he has breathed my life. Nor am I merely a biological organism or machine. I'm a living creature because God has breathed personally into my face and caused me to live. But let's move on. Uh, animals, birds, and fish ha, are also living creatures. Nefesh Haya. Uh, Genesis 1.24. So this is where I want to go. Do you know, it sounds crazy to us, doesn't it, to go, animals have souls. I think it, sound, it sounded crazy to me the first time I heard it. Um, but I think the Bible says they do. Because if, if, if God makes the man a living creature, a nefesh chayah, look at cha uh, chapter 1, verse 24. God said, let the earth produce living creatures. Nefesh chayim, and that's the plural. Uh, so what is a living creature? A nefesh chayah. According to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. So all the different kinds of animals are what? They, each one is a nefesh chayah, a living creature. Uh, Genesis 1.28, we're given dominion over the other nefesh chayim. Um, to, chapter, that shouldn't be 28. Uh, no, it should. No, chapter 9, verse 10. Um, that's his, this is uh, Noah. Um, and... Uh, Chapter 9, verse 10. Uh, 
God says he's going to establish his covenant with Noah and his descendants and with every living creature, nefesh chayah, that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature. So now the birds are added as well. So all the animals, all the birds, nefesh chayah, living creatures just like us. Um, and why are they living creatures? Because they have the breath of life. So look at the, at the end of the flood. Genesis 7.21. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Um, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. I mean, that's why a flood is so devastating, isn't it? Because it suffocates the breath of life out of you. It separates soul and body. So, animals have a certain kind of soul. It, it is right to describe humans as animals. As long as we don't stop there. So what is it that makes humans different? I'm going to try and leave time for five minutes of questions at the end. Well, it's what kind of soul do we have? Uh, th heading three, human creatures are rational, relational, ensouled bodies. So see how I've built it up. Human creatures are bodies. Human creatures are ensouled or living, animate bodies. But what kind of life do we have? What kind of life has God given us? What kind of soul do we have? Well, we are rational and relational ensouled bodies. So let's look. Another way of saying that is we are persons. Okay, let's look at Genesis 1. Um, and let's look at uh, verses 20 to 22. This is uh, day five of the creation narrative. And God said, let the waters... I think that they should say swarm, although I quite like swam, uh, with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created, and, and on it goes. And God blessed them, saying, "Be fruit." Now, does this ring a bell? Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And if I was more skilled at PowerPoint, I'd have done this slide in two stages, wouldn't I? And we'd have just had that. And gone, doesn't that sound an awful lot like the creation of humanity? Be, God bless them saying, be fruitful and multiply. But then you come to the creation of humanity and it sounds an awful lot like it, but really very different. Let me, let me try and do it with, without the words in different colours. And God said, let man be made in our image after our likeness. So God created Man, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And very similar. With four very remarkable differences. So before we move on to the next slide, just notice, let us make man. God doesn't just say, let man come into being in the way he does with every other creature. And then, of course, there's talk about the image of God. And then this extraordinary moment where God has been speaking and speaking and speaking and calling into being uh, everything in creation. And then you get, and God blessed them, and God said to them. Here is a creature that is directly addressed by God. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then, not just filling, but subdue and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing, every nefesh chayah that moves on the earth. So let's go to the next slide. What are the differences? Four differences, I think, between the creation of birds and fish and the creation of humans. First is that let us make, which is, as I said yesterday, and, and as has been said uh, in other places already in the conference, this is the first hint that the one God, the creator of heaven and earth, exists as a trinity of persons. That, that there is a divine discussion going on here. God is not turning to the angels, as I said yesterday, he's not turning to the angels saying, can you give us a hand here, guys, this is a tricky bit. 
God alone made all things. This is a hint that the one God exists as a trinity of persons. And the rest of the Bible spells this out very clearly. In him, in Jesus, all things were created. Without him was not anything made that has been made. Uh, Genesis 1-2, it's the spirit of God who hovers over the surface of the deep. So there's a hint that the one God exists as a trinity of persons, um, that there are, there's a profound sense of relation in God's being. The second thing, God makes man in his... And so it's, I think it's just striking that that comes in, his, in connection with making man in his image, male and female. And I don't want to push that too hard. There are, there are ways up where, in which I think that can be pushed in quite a long way. We mustn't think of God as like a team of friends. Um, who just happen to get along very nicely together and like doing stuff together. God's unity is far more profound than the unity of three human people. But nevertheless, there's an echo of God's life that we are made in his image, male and female. This profound dignity that I was talking about yesterday with the illustration of the font at reflecting Salisbury Cathedral. That's what we're designed to do, reflect the glory of God back to him, outwards to one another, and then over the rest of creation. But then this extraordinary thing that God speaks to us. He doesn't just speak about us. God speaks about the rest of creation. God speaks to us. Because we are the creatures that he has made with the capacity to hear his voice, understand his words, and respond. So, I mean, it's breathtaking. As the persons of the Trinity eternally communicate with each other, let us make in a way that is entirely appropriate to them as divine persons, so in a way that is appropriate to us as creatures, they communicate with us. And I've got a friend who likes to say, how good God is that he made chocolate and taste buds. He didn't just make the thing, but he made the the receptors. But you know something better? how good God is, that he spoke words and gave us ears. How good God is that he spoke words and gave us rational minds that are capable of hearing his voice and understanding his communication. How good God is that he gave us lungs and mouths and tongues and teeth. So that it's not just a funny game going, nefesh chaya. But we're the creature with the capacity to speak back. Not speak back in the kind of rude way, but speak back to God. I've got a friend who said, you know, know someone who's a teacher who said to to a boy in the class, stop talking back to me. And the boy goes, that's how conversations work. (laughs) Um, It's how conversations work. And not just to speak to God, because unlike the other animals, Adam speaks. He speaks by naming the other animals, and then he speaks to the woman. It's quite nice that the first words that a human really speaks that we hear, it's a love song, isn't it? But again, there's a difference, isn't there, in our communication with our pets and our communication with our friends. I hope there is. Don't pat your friends on the head too much. Especially the bald ones. (laughs) I speak from experience. And then lastly, related to all of this, God gives us dominion. Because dominion requires Physical stuff, yeah, of course. We need bodies, actually, in order to exercise dominion. But we need minds. We need to be able to think and plan. We need to be able to communicate and cooperate. 
And most importantly of all, if we are to exercise dominion over God's creation faithfully, we need to be able to listen and speak. If you're trying to do stuff in the world without listening to God and without asking for his guidance and wisdom and help, will you please stop? Because you will do harm. And by which I don't mean stop doing things in the world, I mean stop not listening to God and stop not talking to God. Oh, there's so much that could be said. But I, yeah, I think I want to stop here and just go, we are cre the creature that is made to communicate with God. I think that is, that is what is fundamental about being human. That we are rational, we are relational, we are living, we are bodies. So we are rational, relational, living bodies. From him and through him, and to him. And so listening to God's voice in Scripture and responding to him in prayer and worship and thanksgiving is the most human you will ever be. It is absolutely at the heart, it is basic to being authentically, truly, flourishingly human. When you're reading the Bible, you're not just opening a book and studying words. I love uh, the description of a, a theologian called Catherine Sonderegger, who takes us to Moses at the burning bush and goes, Moses has to take his, his shoes off because he is standing on holy ground because God's fiery presence is there. And God goes, Moses. And Kate Sonderegger goes, the Bible is not just a book. The Bible is our burning bush. It is the fiery, communicating presence of God. So that as you open the Bible, as I open the Bible, as I sit under the preaching of the word this morning in the tent, God is going, Matthew, not taking words that just were there 2,000 years ago and written on a page and going, now can you figure that out and what that means? We have to do that hard work. But we do that hard work in order that right now in the presence, the risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ, who is in our midst, calls us by name, addresses us to shape us and form us to be the rational, relational, living creatures who bring glory to his name. Let's stop there. I think we've got probably two minutes for questions. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Wow. That's a lovely question. Does the word soul name an object or does it name an attribute of an object? Because I've used the word in both ways. Um, I, th I think I want to gently push away from the idea that the soul is a distinct object, that it's more the motor and the driving force, it's the, the, the animating principle that gives life to our bodies. The thing that gives me a moment of hesitation about what I've been talking about today is the doctrine of the intermediate state, the idea that, you know, when we die, our souls go straight to be with the Lord. It's not that we just stop existing for however long it takes until Jesus comes back, and then all of a sudden we come back into existence again. No, our souls go straight. So there is a sense in which that our soul, having been breathed into our bodies, our bodies cannot survive without our souls, but actually our souls can survive without our bodies. So I don't know how to fit all that together. I'm just sort of that's something I'm puzzling through at the moment. It's a, love, it's a great question. What, one more question? Yeah. It's a really interesting question, Richard. Thank you. Um, are there any non-Christians who believe in a version of hylomorphism, or has everyone either gone dualist or materialist? Um, 
I don't know is the answer to the question. I think one of the things that's really interesting thing that's happened, there has been a revival among philosophers of the kind of idea of the body-soul relationship that I've been talking about today, the hylomorphism. They've tended to be Christian philosophers. They've tended to be Catholic philosophers. And then some theologians like me who get excited by all this stuff. There's a really interesting book by, well, there's a really interesting man called, Ro I think it's Robbie George who's written it, who's written a book on sort of souls and bodies and the ethical implications for this and going, actually, if we just understand hylomorphism, this will solve a lot of the ethical questions we have. Um, Robbie George is a Catholic um, who teaches at Princeton University. He's utterly brilliant and also very kind and gracious. I think we're seeing a resurgence. I don't know whether there are non-Christians, but I think it is now an academically credible position in a way that it probably wasn't 20 or 30 years ago, would be what I would say. So, so I think we can actually do it without recourse to the Bible and God immediately and just say, let's. Edward Fazer is the other guy, F-E-S-E-R. He's another Roman Catholic philosopher who's written a bunch of stuff, um, including interacting with the new atheists at a more popular level. But then he's written some more technical works on this kind of understanding of how humans are constituted.